Wow. Um, it's what happens when you get around a, an apostolic church and then Junesco Sar. There are five words I want to preach tonight. Five words that explain what you just saw. There are five words that make that happen. You think about the video we watched prior to that, which was a summary video of 2020 that we put together for our 30,000 plus ministry partners that support MPD missionaries based in America. So that was put together for our American partners, but I thought it would, thought it would encourage you. There are five words that can explain that when this I don't want to go down that trail. Five words that will explain not only global mission, not only evangelism and church planting and campus ministry, but five words that explain how you got saved. Five words that will explain how you grow in your faith, sanctification. Five words will explain what happened this afternoon. It was an honor to be a part of the graduation from the ministry schools. Where are the graduates? Ministry School Graduation. All right. There are five words that will explain the spiritual growth you had in the past year. Okay, is that simple enough? I'll get to those when we get to the text. <laughs> I want to give you a little, bit, a, a little bit more about what's happening around the world from not an every nation perspective, but global Christianity. And there are five words that explain this. 121 years ago in 1900, 18% of global Christians lived in what is now called the Global South, which used to be called the Third World, then it was the Developing World, then it was the Two-Thirds World, and then missiologists changed the terminology every 10 years, I think, just to keep people confused. Of course, the Global South doesn't mean it's south of the equator, but that's another story we'll take up with the missiologist. But in 1900, 18% of the Christian population in the whole world lived in the global south. Today, 66% lives in the global south. So in 100 years, the center of Christianity has shifted dramatically. The global center. For instance, today, there are two times the number of Protestants in Nigeria compared to Germany, where the Protestant Reformation started. There are double the number of Catholics in Brazil than in Italy, the home of the Pope. There are more evangelicals in Nepal. Now, let's pause on Nepal a moment. We have multiple every nation churches there that are thriving. It's a Hindu kingdom. 30 years ago when I moved to Asia, 35 years ago, we started praying for Nepal. We started looking into doing outreaches. And in that time when I got to the Philippines, there were less than 100 Christians in Nepal. Today, there are more evangelicals in Nepal than there are in Spain. Can you guess what the top six missionary sending nations are right now? The first, the top, I'll read them, read them in order. It's the U.S. That's not in the global south. And I'm thankful. I think it's the only thing that's keeping the hand of God from judging my nation, perhaps. Maybe there are other things, but <laughs> God forbid if we stop sending missionaries. Maybe what's going on makes more want to go. <laughs> but here are the other top six. South Korea, Brazil, the major missionary sending nation, Philippines, China, and India. So four of the top six missionary sending nations in the world are global south. That's what's happening in Christianity around the world. 
Five words explain it. Let's go to our text. And this is a challenge because this is a familiar passage to all of you. It is so familiar. You have studied it. You have exegeted it. You have preached it. You're preachers. You have preached it. You've taught it. You've read books. You've researched it. You've heard this so many times. I was not feeling real happy when I felt like this was what I was supposed to preach. It's easier for me anyway to preach obscure passages because if I mess it up, most people don't know. But this one is sacred. It's all sacred. This one is so familiar. It's a challenge to keep you and me engaged. I told Morgan, I've preached this so many times, usually from Matthew, but this time from Mark. But I'm trying it a different, I've never preached it like this tonight. And I told Morgan, this may be the first time and the last time. We'll see. All right, here we go. Mark chapter 4. We're beginning in verse 9. I'm sorry, verse 3. I'm back in Matthew. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, and it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Others fell among the thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around with him, him with the 12, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. 13, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Five words, the sower sows the word. All right, this is the word of God we're reading. The sower sows the word. The sower sows the word. Why did everything you just see happen? Because the sower sowed the word. How did you get saved? Because the sower sowed the word. How did you grow in your faith? Because the sower sowed the word. How did you grow in leadership? Because the sower sowed the word. How did new churches get planted? Why? How? So two questions. Who is the sower? And what is the word? Who is the sower? What is the word? Dr. Timothy Tennant is the president of Asbury Theological Seminary. And he gave a sermon at a, an Asbury Seminary chapel service. And he grew up, spent much of his life as a missionary in India. His daughter is a missionary in a very remote tribe, I think in, in somewhere in southern, I think Tanzania. Dr. Tennant talked about this parable And he was talking to, he didn't name the nation, but it was someone in East Asia, I'm guessing India, which are somewhere in the area where he did a lot of ministry. And he said, in in the West, he said, I've never understood this, but in the West, uh, where, where I'm from, farmers plow, then they plant. But he said, I've heard that in parts of Asia, they plant and then plow. And he looked at his farm and he said, what is that called? What do you call that when a farmer sows the seed and then plows? And he said, this farmer looked at him and said, we call that stupid. (laughs) 
And Dr. Tennant said, so you don't do that? He goes, no, nobody does that. But somebody did. Somebody did it. The next few verses I'm not going to read, verses 14 through 20, is Jesus explaining this odd farmer who plants, sows the seed before he plows. And what you find is two-thirds of it or three-fourths of it is wasted. And the next verses, 14 through 20, the phrase, the word, is mentioned eight times. The word, 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 the word. What was that culture we wanted? A culture of biblical learning. The word. And so when Jesus explains it, it's all about the word. And he gives these four soil types. He explains it. There's the along the path. And you know what he says? That's, it, it, let me explain along the path. Um, when my, uh, grand, one of my grandsons, uh, Jonathan Edward Jr., we call him Junior. When, uh, when, when Junior, for his, was it his second birthday, that his other, his Filipino grandfather gave him a four-wheeler, you know, some places they call them quad bikes or a four-wheeler. I don't know what you call that here. You know what I'm talking about? I think they were designed for like six-year-olds and up, but he was two, right? He's got to be called to race car driving. He jumped on that thing, and in my son and daughter-in-law's backyard... He went, they had a beautiful yard, gardens and, and hours, killed all the grass, made this pathway as hard as concrete. Some seed fell along the path. That's what it's talking about. My grandson making dirt into concrete. What happened to the part that fell along the path? It said, Satan came. To take the word. Satan came to steal the word. The next one was on the rocky ground. If you've ever been to Israel, you kind of go, well, isn't it all rocky ground? Is there any ground in this whole land that's not mostly rocks? And he said that on the rocky ground, Jesus explains it, there were no roots and no depth. No roots, no depth, so it doesn't last very long. How many had disciples like that? No roots and no depth. And so what happened? Persecution came because of the word. Satan came to do what? To steal the word. Persecution came because of the word among the thorns. And then it said, this thorny stuff, these things grow, and it chokes out like a WWE chokehold. <laughs> it chokes out what? The Word. If you want a Satan-free life, a persecution-free life, if you don't want demonic hands around your neck choking you, stay out of the Word. That Bible can mess up your life. This Bible can mess up your comfort zone. It can mess up your bad heart. It can mess up all kinds of messed up values and attitudes because once you get the word in, then Satan comes. Once you get the word, then persecution comes. Once you get the word, there's a chokehold after you. And it's all because of the word. Some of you think, man, I was just cruising as a nominal Christian, but when I got into this discipleship path, all hell, literally all hell broke loose because you're in the word. I'm not suggesting that you quit. <laughs> and then that third soil, there was good soil. I thought often, why didn't that farmer just go to the good soil? It's obvious in Israel where the good soil is. 
You'd have to be blind not to be able to discern. That's good soil. That's concrete. That's rocks. Those are weeds. Those are... Why not just go plant? That's a big question. Why? Why farm like this? Good soil. 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, the 30, 60, and 100 fold, it's not miraculous. In that part of the world, a, 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 a typical crop, a typical yield would have been from 10% would have been a bad yield. There are parts that can yield up to 100 uh, seeds for every one you sow. So it's not like this is miracle. That is really good, but it's not supernaturally miracle. This is normal life, but on the good side. Now, that as a context to the text, who is the sower? I've always thought for most of my ministry life that that's me, the preacher. Or maybe someone who's not a preacher, but they're out evangelizing or whatever. And as a preacher, I developed this str strategy that I'm going to focus on good soil. I'm going to find campuses that are good soil and focus there. I could spend half the effort and have 100 disciples, or I could go to this other one that's hard and rocky and full of thorns, and I get one disciple, and I've gotten 100 over here for the same effort. That's kind of logical, right? I'm a logical person. I don't want to waste time. So as a preacher, as a church planter, as a disciple maker, that was what drove me strategically. Only so on good soil. Now, as a preacher, many of you preach on a regular basis. You preach the word. Motivational speeches don't change anybody. Preaching the word changes people. Relevancy changes no one. I have found some people who try so hard to be so relevant, and they are so relevant, they just forgot the word. Facilitating self-help talks don't change anybody, not for eternity. Preaching the word. But I, over the years, I rethought this. What if the ultimate sower is actually not us? Imagine with me for a minute. What if we're not the ones who sow? What if there's something else being said here? What if God is the sower? What if he's the one? Then it makes sense why he sowed on hard ground, and rocky ground, and thorny ground. In that same chapel message, Dr. Tennant said, and he kind of referenced um, strength finder test. He didn't mention them by name, but he says, he said, we have come up, our faculty at Asbury, we've come up with a way to evaluate the different heart types, hard, rocky, thorny, and good. And based on your papers you submitted, Morgan was an Asbury student, so I don't know what they rated you, but he said, based on the data, um, we have identified each student and what heart type you are. And we're going to now ask you to seat in those areas. And eventually you realize he's joking. And he said, it, actually, it's impossible for you to seat in certain areas. You know, he said, we're going to put the hard hearts over here, the rocky hearts here, the, and the good hearts here. And he said, actually, it's impossible because, he said, if you're like me, I'm all for all at the same time just depends on the issue and the day of the week <laughs> because in some areas I'm hard-hearted I agree with Dr. Tennant in some areas I've got some rocks that need to go in other areas I'm good soil and there are seasons in life where I've, maybe I'm mostly good soil and then there are other seasons where I don't know is that you is that your reality I know we like to think we're the good soil 
And then we kind of think, oh, those, that guy's a hard soil. What if God's the one who sows? Then we see his heart. Aren't you glad that God wasn't as strategic as me? Because I strategically decided to leave the hard and the thorny and the rocky alone and just go to the good. If God sowed that way, he wouldn't sow. Because you understand, there's no good soil when it comes to our hearts. His only option was to sow in hard-hearted, thorny, rocky places and sow and sow and sow and sow and sow and and keep sowing. Aren't you glad he did it that way? He sowed Paul to some hard, rocky, thorny soil called the Gentiles. He sowed Peter to some hard, rocky soil called the Jews. Tradition tells us he sowed Thomas to India, Andrew to Greece, and eventually what we now call Russia, Philip to all of the North Africa Mediterranean coast, all up and down that area. If you go into church history, you find out he sowed the Moravians everywhere nobody else would go. Boniface, he sowed to what's now Germany. Patrick, he sowed to the Irish. Wesley, not just to the English, but to those that wouldn't go to church out in the fields. Francis Asbury, he sowed to America from England. Partially because, as the irony of it is, because he was uneducated. Wesley was an Oxford grad, and he didn't really think much of Asbury. Okay, let's just send him to America. They don't really need educated people over there, those colonists. Let's send him there. And the seminary is named after him. He sold Wolfie and Allie from Namibia to South Africa to London. He showed, sold Joshua and Yinka Opadia from Lagos, Nigeria to plant an amazing Every Nation Church in Sydney, Australia. He sold Ernie Kruger to the nation of Texas. Gareth Lowe to Berlin that calls itself the atheist capital of the world. Brian Milligan to one of the hardest, most thorny, most rocky cities in the world and one of the least Christian nations on the planet to Istanbul, Turkey. What an amazing job he's doing. From Zimbabwe to Grahamstown to Turkey. Grahamstown people are all over the world. Speaking of Grahamstown, he sowed Leicester to Brazil. Who's next? Where is he sowing you? Here, here's, the, here's the good news and the good news and maybe the bad news for some. All the easy places are already taken. I mean... Atlanta, Dallas, and Nashville have more mega churches per capita than probably anywhere in the world. And so everybody wants to plant a church in Atlanta, Dallas, or Nashville. Because you get a lot of spillover. Not so much in Boston. Not so much in New York. That's just my nation. You have places like that here. Who does he want to sow next and where? Maybe God's really the sower, ultimately. What is the word? What is he sowing? Any text I read, I try my best. I don't always succeed, but I try my best to find where is Jesus in this story? Whether it's an Old Testament text or near to wherever, where is Jesus? Where is Jesus in this? Where is the gospel in this story? Because he's there and it's there. Think about that. Where's Jesus? Where's the gospel? When we talk about what is the word in this story Jesus is telling. Two scriptures, and they've already been referenced multiple times. John 1.1, in the beginning was the word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he tells us nothing came into being that he wasn't involved in creating. We go down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. He sows the word. The sower sows the word. If God is the sower, he sows the word. He sows Jesus. What does that mean? Where is the gospel in this? Is this just the message of, hey, go preach harder. Go preach more. Go to more cities and more nations. Yeah, that's part of it, sure. There's got to be more than that. It's not just do better and work harder. That's not the gospel. Look at Roman, John chapter 12, and we'll tr try to wrap up here. 12, 23. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And you know they're excited about that because they think now he's going to wipe out the Romans. And we're going to be the blessed people. We're going to be the chosen race again, the Israelites, the Jews. This is us. All you other people who've been persecuting us, your time is coming. Our king is about to take you down from the top rope. <laughs> this is the time to be glorified. No more of this persecution stuff. Truly, truly, I say to you, here's how it's going down. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. Who's the sower? If God's the sower, what's the word? That's his son. Jesus is the grain. Jesus is the seed that was sown. Thank God, not just in good hearts. He was sown into hard, thorny, rocky, rebellious, arrogant, sinful hearts like mine and yours and your neighbors and the people in your community. God sowed the seed. It went in the ground and died. What happened? It bore much fruit. So what do we do? Then, because of what Jesus did, we now become the sowers. And the sower sows the word and when we sow the word you know what we're sowing we are sowing jesus in the lives of people that's what he's done for us that's what he calls us to do let's bow and pray lord thank you that you did not come for the righteous or the godly or the good instead you came for every one of us. Thank you that you sowed into all of the kind of soils that we were. And Lord, we will gladly go and sow the word wherever you call us to. In Jesus' name, amen.